Welcome everyone. Welcome to our webinar this morning, What Makes Education Catholic? So glad to have you with us from right across Canada. Uh, it's such an urgent topic and I'm sure we will get a lot out of it. Uh, my name is Joseph Sinisak. I'm the Publishing Director of Novalis Publishing. Uh, we are partnering today with the Catholic Curriculum Corporation to bring you this webinar with, with Thomas Groom and Patricia Del Ben. Let's get going. I said at the beginning that today's topic is of vital importance and not just to those engaged in Catholic education, nor even just the Catholic community, but really to Canadian society as a whole. So today, with the help of one of the world's leading scholars, practitioners of religious education, Dr. Thomas Groom, we're going to explore the roots of this gift to the world and reflect on how our tradition can be a strong foundation for our practice today. So to lead us in our conversation with Tom, I've asked Patricia Del Ben to help us out. Patricia is a well-known Catholic educator to many of you. She is a passionate advocate for our school system and its religious foundations. She's a religious education uh, consultant with the Halton Catholic District School Board here in Ontario. And today is also representing the Catholic Curriculum Corporation, our key partner for this webinar. So Patricia, welcome to you. Uh, Patricia is going to provide a full introduction for our speaker, and she will also be monitoring the chat to draw your questions and comments into this conversation, as I had already mentioned. So over to you, Patricia. Thank you so much, Joe. This is so exciting. I'm so thankful and honored to be part of, of today, and I'm sure uh, you will all find this book and Dr. Groom to be riveting. Uh, it's an important time for us to, to delve deep into what it means to be a Catholic educator. Um, I acknowledge that my home is on Treaty 13, and it lies on the west bank of Little Thundering Waters near the village at the crossing. These lands are the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, the Attawandaran, the Haudenosaunee, and the Métis. And I deeply thank the Indigenous people of this land for their stewardship and care for the earth. Together, we will continue to seek truth. I learn and hope and pray and work for reconciliation, reconciliation with the past and with the present. Together, we will make restitutions for a future of hope and health for all. Today is the feast of St. Mark the Evangelist, and he says, proclaim the good news to all creation, and I do think that's what we're going to do today. It is my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome Dr. Groom to this webinar, generously hosted by Novalis and the Curriculum Corporation. Dr. Groom is a senior professor of theology and religious education at Boston College and is the long-serving director of its PhD in theology and education. He is a Catholic catechist who has mentored and nurtured many, myself included. And through his books and papers on Catholic education, Dr. Groom has identified what makes education Catholic. This being the title of his latest book. Thank you so much, Dr. Groom, for being here. Welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you, Patricia. You are so gracious and generous in your comment. And there's an old Irish saying that an expert is someone who is a long way from home. <clears throat> so that's probably why I come in and out of Canada with great delight because I can be an expert up there. Whereas if you talk to my wife or son, I'm no great <laughs> expert at all. But thank you, Joe, for the lovely introduction. When people introduced me as one of the leading Catholic educators in the world, I was and that's a slight exaggeration. That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but, uh, but thank you so much. Uh, I'm delighted, and thanks to Nova Alice for making this possible, and to you, Joe, uh, for taking the initiative, and Patricia for hosting us this morning, and uh, <clears throat> I'm delighted. I'm delighted to be with you. I'm going to make a few opening comments, uh, and then Patricia and I will begin to enter the conversation, then she will mediate your comments, and be sure to share your wisdom with us, not just your questions, share your answers as well, because you're gifted and, and, and experienced people who have learned a great deal of wisdom <clears throat> along the way about what makes education Catholic. So be sure to share, rather than just ask questions, no, if questions, ask them, but, but share your wisdom as well. Now, what I, I wanna introduce the book what, and why I wrote it. Um, what makes education Catholic? Now, you'd, you'd say, surely by now we should know 
what makes education Catholic. We've been doing this for 2000 years. And actually it was quite a, con it was quite a, a conflict or a, a controversy in the early church. Should the church even be involved in education? Isn't it enough just to teach the gospel and not be getting into reading, writing, arithmetic and rhetoric and trying to give people a good education? But, and there was lots of good people on, on both sides, but the right side prevailed. And indeed the church embraced this as a current aspect, as a central aspect, I should say, of its mission to the world, to educate people and to educate in faith, but also to educate in the, in the broad sense of education all across the board. So it's been a question for, for a while, but now I think it's a much more urgent question. And especially just to take some of the examples, just take the personnel change in our schools. Now, the estimates I often see is that are in sometime around the mid 60s, let's say 60, 1965, that up to 95% of the faculty and teachers and, and, and administrators of a Catholic schools were typically vowed religious. So the nuns, the priests, the brothers were running these schools. And we kind of didn't ask about their spiritual identity because we, we just were confident that, that uh, these vowed religious people would take care of that. So that's and she, just now, I mean, 65, 95%, but now we're less than 3%, at least in the United States, less than 3% of our faculty and leadership in Catholic education are vowed religious. Or take the enrollment changes that are happening and will continue to happen. <clears throat> now, again, I, I know this is happening in Canada. It's certainly happening here in the United States. There's a good Catholic school down the road for me here, Catholic Memorial, and it's now one third uh, people from other traditions. And indeed, many of the young people that are attending from Catholic traditions are more cultural Catholics than we'd say practicing Catholics. Uh, <clears throat> but that's writ large throughout the world. Catholic schools are booming in many, many cultures, and especially contexts that have government funding. So in Australia, New Zealand, Africa, and so on. And then in places like Korea, like 80% Catholic schools are booming in Korea and are well-funded by the government there, but 80% of the student body and 80% of the faculty and staff are not Catholic. So how do they maintain the Catholicity of these schools? Or take Pakistan, there's a huge Catholic education system, schooling system in Pakistan, over 500 schools, is the premier educational system of the country, but 90% of the students are Muslim, uh, come from and go back into Muslim tradition. So <clears throat> how do we welcome everybody and yet maintain the integrity of what we're advertising, saying that we are a Catholic school? Now, Pope Francis came out recently and said, look, he was asked about the diversity of students in our schools. And Francis came out and said, look, welcome them all. Welcome them all, they're all welcome. Because he said, Catholic education is grounded in great spiritual values that in fact are universal. I mean, they are, for us, they arise from our faith tradition, but in fact, the values that represent Catholic education are, are, are universal. And so any person, this is what the Holy Father said, any person of goodwill can embrace and be enriched by them. <clears throat> but then I raise the question, <clears throat> Pardon me. Who is to be the stewards? Uh, who are to be the stewards? Who is, who is to maintain uh, the spiritual values and see to it that these great values that arise from our faith <clears throat> but could enrich any life? Who will, who will be the stewards of that tradition? Um, and I'm proposing that we need a cadre of spiritual leaders. It doesn't mean that everybody in the school has to be card carrying party members and equally enthusiastic about it all, but at least we need a core cadre of faculty and staff and people that know the tradition, com are committed to it and what it means uh, for a school and for the life of a school. Um, and especially I would say the principal or the leading person, whoever that might be, people in the school. I wanna tell a quick story. Uh, oh, it's about 30 summers ago now, I was just about to begin my summer school at Boston College. And we had people in those days from all over the world, we still do. But uh, <clears throat> this older gentleman walked in about uh, 8, 8.25 and start, class was starting at 8.30. And he came in, but he was visibly taken aback when he came in the door and he saw me sitting up. And this is 35 years ago. And uh, so he came over to me and he said, um, uh, he wanted to make sure he's in the right class, first of all. And I said, told him, yes, I, he was registered. And he said, yeah, um, he said, uh, uh, you're very young. You're very young. And, and I said, well, I said, give me time. You know, give me time. Uh, <clears throat> he said, yeah, but you've, you've, written, you've written a couple of books. 
I said, yeah, I have. I said, it's called getting tenure at Boston College. Yeah, but he said, have you ever been a, have you ever been a principal? Have you ever been a principal of a high school? I said, actually, no, never, never. And he said, huh. Well, he said, I'm the principal, and then he went on to, uh, into his credentials, of uh, the largest Catholic high school in, let's say, Melbourne. That wasn't the one, but he was from Australia. Uh, so he said, you know, I, I want to improve my, my leadership, you know, the Catholic principal, but basically he was saying, you don't know anything about it. So I said, well, look, we're not just stay for the first hour, and then at the break time, if you like, uh, we'll move you to another class, or two or three other courses going on at the same time. So he went and sat down, grumbling. But he came up at the break time, and he says, I think I'm going to stay. I said, now, why would you stay? He said, because he says, I think I figured out what I really need to learn. Because he said, I know how to run a school. But now he says, I need to learn how to be a spiritual leader. Amen. And he says, maybe, maybe I could learn something in this course. Anyway, we be, by the way, we, we became lifelong friends. And we still are. We still, communicate, still send Christmas cards. Yeah. But he hit the nail on the head. We had to learn now, what does it mean to become a spiritual leader? Now, the question then is, where do we find the great deep values? These universal values, these spiritual values, like the dignity and the equality of all people, uh, to live with honesty and integrity, with mercy and forgiveness, to be committed to great social values, to compassion and justice. Like, where will we find them? And where will we find them writ large in a way that will convince any person of goodwill? Now, I'm going to, I make a very, uh, pick, uh, I don't know, surprising proposal in the book. And I think most Catholics are surprised by, especially old traditional Catholics, are surprised by what I propose. I propose that the primary place to find the deep values that are to undergird and permeate Catholic education, the best place to find them is in Jesus. Imagine. The Christ. The Christ. Wow. <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth. Now, even Patricia is saying, wow, because <laughs> it surprises us. You know, and, and now there's a long-winded explanation, and it, we need both, but the Catechism of the Catholic Church puts it powerfully. It's in paragraph 426, and it lays out that Catholicism is made up of all kinds of sacraments and symbols and creeds and codes and dogmas and doctrines, but then the Catechism says, but at the heart, at the heart, we find a person, yeah. and I love how the Catechism puts it, the person of Jesus of Nazareth the only son from the father. In other words, Jesus of Nazareth, the historical character, that carpenter who walked the roads of Galilee, who indeed we believe in our faith was the presence, was the divine presence in human history, made flesh among us as one of ourselves. But we need both. And as Catholic Christians, we have more emphasized the Christ of faith then we have the Jesus of history. Now, there's a whole explanation for that that would take me too far afield. But one of the places was in the old catechisms. The old catechisms that you didn't grow up with, I grew up with, your parents grew up with, uh, they all were based on the Apostles' Creed. And so they took each article of the Creed and catechized it. I believe in God the Father Almighty. Who is God? God is the Father in heaven. Why did God make you? Blah, blah, blah. I still know the Maduth Catechism that I learned in my Irish village. The difficulty with that was... If you think about it, the, 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 the creedal statement, born of the Virgin Mary, the next article is suffered under Pontius Pilate. In other words, the catechism, the creed, leaves out the life of Jesus. And likewise, the catechism left out the, the human historical life of Jesus. We went from his birth to his death. So that carpenter who walked the roads of Galilee and, and feeding the hungry and telling great stories like the Good Samaritan the, and the prodigal son and all this, we miss out on it. And then we had a very limited uh, uh, cycle of readings uh, at Mass on a Sunday, one year cycle that were typically not well chosen. And even many old cultures read the gospel in Latin. So many of us grew up high and big on the, and firm in our faith in the, in the risen Christ, but the Jesus of history. And I think there's a great power to turning to Jesus as Catholic educators, because you know what? He was most of all an educator, a teacher. We give him all kinds of titles, son of God and all kinds of things, which are all wonderful. But he was a teacher and he taught every step of the way, not only just by his pedagogy. And I could go on and on about that for a long time. And I do in the book uh, <laughs> about the pedagogy of Jesus, but everything about him taught. Like, I mean, there's only two miracles reported six times 
in the Gospels, uh, the miracle of the resurrection and the miracle of the loaves and fishes, the multiplying of the loaves and fishes to feed hungry people. It's four, in all four Gospels and then twice in Matthew, twice in Mark, whose Patricia notices uh, the feast we celebrate today. It must have been the central aspect of his public ministry, feeding the hungry. But look at what he was teaching. And thousands and thousands of people, like 5,000, 4,000, 7,000, not counting women and children, all over the place, feeding hungry people. Yes. What do we learn from that? Yes. You, you actually say this in your preface. That, you know, At its core, Catholic faith reflects an essentially positive understanding of the human person, is committed to the dignity and rights of all people, and is convinced of their potential to be agents for their own good and the common good of all. A marvelous quote. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. And it brings me back into focus. Let me just wind down mm -hmm. and say that it's, of course, you know, there was 2000 years since then. Uh, you know, we've, we have a whole rich Catholic intellectual tradition to draw upon. But I keep bringing Jesus with me throughout the whole book and what we can learn today from how he went about it. And, and uh, like it, just the one that, uh, that Patricia just mentioned, the anthropology that he, that he favored, the understanding of the human person and the empowerment of people. Imagine him saying to poor peasant people, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Or my, my favorite is that after he cured somebody, he almost invariably said to the cured person, your faith has cured you. He never says, I have cured you. But he says, your faith has saved you, your faith. The woman with the hemorrhage for 12 years that comes to touch the hem of his, of his garment. He says, he, he, when he finally finds her, he, he addresses her as daughter, which was a way of bringing her back into the community. She was a daughter of Abraham and Sarah. She was included again because, for, because of her bleeding, she was socially excluded. Um, but then he says to her, your faith, your faith heal you. What an empowerment, what an affirmation of the potential, the possibility we have as human beings. And I could go on and on. But let me wind down and, 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 and hand it back to Patricia um, because um, there is the, 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 one of the things I try to deal with in the book, and maybe this is something we could even talk about a little, is how do we do good religious education in our schools while still welcoming everybody and, and so on. Um, it's interesting, Benazir Bhutto, and this is my last comment, and I'll open it to, I'll give, hand it back to Patricia. Benazir Bhutto, God rest her soul, the, the first woman to become prime minister in a uh, predominantly Muslim country, uh, tragically assassinated. But Bhutto always said that she learned her Muslim faith at Jesus and Mary Convent School in Karachi. And that she also learned something about herself as a woman that enabled her to put herself forward for the highest office in the land that she might not have learned otherwise. So Catholic education, in a sense, gave her a different sense of herself as a woman, but also nurtured her in her Muslim faith. And I think that's the kind of challenges that we have now and that I try to propose some ways of proceeding in the book. All right. Patricia, okay. I'm in your good hands. I think, I think the part of the book that I find riveting and that for me was really inspirational was um, in, in your sections that's, that talk about renewing your vocation as Catholic educator. And, and you, you say on page 43, the pedagogy of Catholic educators, they're confident in God's grace and they should be most encouraging of all students, lending hope ac across the spectrum of student gifts. And so I think this renewing your vocation as Catholic educator, um, it, it's not a one-off. It's something that we do on a regular basis. Can you speak a little bit about um, what, where that uh, came from and what, what you hope educators will, will get from there? It's a great question, Patricia. And you see, it's the other side of the coin to the Jesus of history. Because we believe that this carpenter fellow was actually the son of God. And that this Christ of ours, and, and this Easter season is such an appropriate note to sound, died and rose for us, lived for, died for what he lived for, and rose for what he lived for. And that this, that this Christ now is a source of what Paul, St. Paul constantly calls God's abundant grace. 
that now we have an abundance of God's grace so that we've always got hope. And there is always hope uh, that, that, that the tyranny will not, will not last, that, that truth, that falsehood can't become true, uh, that no addiction is beyond recovery. Uh, there's always hope, we believe now, because of this risen Christ. I think it's one of the greatest gifts that Catholic education can give our young people to assure them, even if they don't know the source of it or don't believe, but to assure them that as they go through life, no matter what comes their way, there will always be hope. And in other words, there'll always be the grace of God, the grace of God, God's effective love, that is gratia, that is free. It's not that it's earned or deserved. It's, it's free. I often think the people that I know who know this best are people in recovery. In 12-step groups, they'll all tell you they can't do it without the help of higher power. Mm -hmm. uh, the only way they can stay dry or off drugs or what have you is, is by the help of grace, God's grace. Uh, and so as, as, as it's a wonderful note to sound uh, through our Catholic education, this, this note of hope that you refer to so well, mm -hmm. because it's one of our greatest gifts uh, to, to bring to young people as they face into into the horizons and the challenges and the difficulties of life. Yes, and and you also speak, there's a, um, a, a I guess your tag of um, from and for faith that comes up repeatedly in the text. Could you explain a little bit about what that means from and for faith? Well, I will, Patricia, again, a fine question. First of all, our convictions, that undergird our pedagogy. And by pedagogy, I don't mean just how we teach. I mean what we teach, where we teach, who we teach, how we teach. The whole school environment is the, is the, is the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So, so the, curriculum, the curriculum is the whole, the whole life of the school. But so that curriculum should arise out of faith convictions. Uh, it should be shaped by faith convictions uh, and it should permeate uh, with faith convictions, that our, our undergirding, our rationale is not a philosophy. Now, we could be enhanced by a good philosophy of education, by a good social, social scientific research uh, can, can indeed enhance our educating. But that the original grounding of it, in fact, is spiritual. It, it arises out of the spirituality. So, and in a sense, we educate from that perspective, mm -hmm. from deep spiritual values. But then, and this may be a bit innovative, and indeed some people may disagree with this, I think we are to educate for faith as well. In other words, and not to become card-carrying party members of the Catholic Church, but to give young people a deep conviction uh, that life has meaning, that life has purpose, that life has ethic, that is not just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, but instead we live into a great transcendent horizon that life is ultimately a, a journey a journey that comes forth from god to travel home to god and with god's help all along the way uh, and lending that hope now i think we should propose that you can't well, you can't, but you see um charles taylor a great canadian philosopher of our time i deeply love the man uh, the man's work he says we've really in this era we've really come down to a clear choice between what he calls a purely imminent frame of life or an imminent come transcendent form of life. In other words, we can, it's now to a choice. We can either believe in God or not believe in God. And, and, and uh, Taylor says, there's good arguments to be made both ways. But you see, the old atheists, Marx and Freud and Nietzsche and these people, they all made it sound as if the only believers now are stupid people people who can't think, people who aren't educated. In other words, as soon as you got a bit of enlightenment, you got a bit of education, you'd stop believing in God. But that's not, no longer true. Some of the greatest architects of our time, Gadamer, Ricoeur, uh, Fiorenza, uh, uh, Taylor himself, are, are believers. Mm -hmm. And they see the rationale for faith as being just as persuasive as the rationale against it. So I think Catholic schools especially have a, an obligation to propose to people what, tran what Karl Rahner calls a transcendent horizon yes. for life, that we live into this ultimate horizon. And, 
and there is an ultimate meaning and purpose and ethic to it all. And uh, and we will be held responsible for how we lived. You know, that, that old Matthew 25 always scares the life out of me. It's one of the reasons <laughs> I go. And I, I sometimes volunteer in a prison because one of the lists on there is, you know, I was in prison, you visited me. So I just want to cover all the bases. But, uh, you know, and God will not say uh, there was a hungry person one time and you fed them. But God will say, I was hungry. He gave me to eat. I was thirsty. He gave me to drink. So this is what we're called into, that ethic that is grounded in an ultimate horizon. And that enables people to make meaning and purpose and to see their life as eminently worthwhile, rather than just simply, as I said, it's all over by the county. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You, you talk about that requiring an imagination, a creativity that even for the educator looking for that creativity and imagination um you know we we spoke about this um a bit this morning uh that we find that in faith that creativity the art the artistic expression of our faith uh, yeah. allows us to find that transcendent allows us to delve into um that horizon and, and of course, Catholicism is such a rich tradition of that by way of our whole sacramental yes. principle that it's all charged with the grandeur of God mm -hmm. and that it will shine out like, sh like, sh like shavings from shook foil. Uh, or as Penny Kavanagh, the Irish boy, say, we're finding God in the bits and pieces of every day. And that's imagination. That's the sacramental principle. As Catholics, you know, when you talk about sacraments, we often think about the seven sacraments. And the, but the seven sacraments are simply the tips of the iceberg yes. of all of the sacramentality of life and the potential to encounter God and God's love for us in the ordinary, the everyday, but especially, as you're saying, in the beautiful, in the aesthetic, uh, that it is possible. And of course, this is the great theme of Ignatius of Loyola, to come to see God in all things. And, uh, and that, now that takes imagination, it takes nurturing and encouraging, but it takes observing, like just getting people to see that they, I, I was amazed here two mornings ago when I looked out my window that the leaves have come back in the last two or three days. But it was just phenomenal. I said, now how does God manage that? Mm -hmm. That these leaves die, come back every year, will live through the summer, will die in the fall. And next year will more than likely come back again. Yeah. It's extraordinary, yeah. extraordinary creativity. But I mean, the presence of God is in that. Absolutely. Even in my little dog, Riley, I often say, Riley, Riley is the ultimate symbol right now of God's love in my life because he's unconditional love. I can be gone for an hour or a week. It doesn't matter. I come back. I'm welcome. Then <laughs> jumped all over, etc., and linked yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. So it, there's so much of the presence of God in the order. But 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 Catholic, sorry, a Catholic education should give people, should lend people, could nurture people in that kind of sacramental consciousness. Yeah. Yes, and that would mean then our classrooms, our schools, our board offices, um, our sacred spaces, our places where we meet and we transcend. And so uh, you mentioned you mentioned uh, a bit of that in your book also is that, that you know we take off our sandals because we know that we are entering into sacred spaces. Sacred ground, sacred ground, and to encourage that because that that's not you see so and I, I come across Catholic schools who think well that's that's the stuff they learn in religion you know in theology course you know that's our that that, that they do that in, in the theology department um, no. Uh, the math teacher can do it, the science teacher. I would have to say that my sacramental consciousness was most formed by a crazy old oblate priest in an Irish boarding school outside of Dublin, and uh, Joe Horn. And Joe taught, he taught uh, science and he taught religion. He was a terrible religion teacher. <laughs> he was an extraordinary science teacher. And he would, no matter whether we were looking through a microscope or a telescope, Joe always says, gentlemen, take a look at that. Isn't that extraordinary? I want to see the beauty of that. How do you, how, how, what do you think? Look at that design that's there. Look at, look at the consistency. Now, let's look at the pattern. He was, he was, we didn't know it. We were 14, 15-year-old boarding kids. Yeah. But he was nurturing us in a sacramental consciousness, a way of looking at life that sees the design and the beauty. And then that mediates us toward God. 
Amen. Amen. <laughs> um, I, I, I will say um, there is somebody who has raised their hand. So uh, Jean Golett, if you wanted to post your question or um, unmute. Sorry, we can't hear you. Oh, there we go. Hi, Jean. Welcome. Yes, good morning. Uh, it's great to hear uh, Tom again. Um, Thank you, Jean. Yes, years ago, I had the privilege of taking a course with you at Boston College. Ah, I knew, recognize the name, I was going to say. We can't <laughs> see you, Jean, I wish we could. Uh, Neither one of us have aged or grown old. Or that's like right. That. That's right. And um, still as young as I, ever. I, I made the mistake of putting up my hand. I didn't realize what I was doing. But I'm delighted just to be able to say hello and love what you're you're saying about the transcendent, about the sacramentality of uh, of life. And thank you for that. You're welcome. You, Jean. Blessings. Blessings. If I'm not mistaken, I saw someone else's hand come up, but it quickly went down. Uh, Maureen Malloy. Maureen, do you want to join us? They have to both unmute and then also and, and then, I know the video, the video as well. Oh, here's Maureen. Maureen, tell us where you're from. And do you have a question or a comment? Oh, unmute. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. I can there hear you. This is great. Um, I have been pondering for some time what's happening in our Catholic high schools. <clears throat> I have a grandson in grade 11 in a Catholic high school. Mm -hmm. And in it, I, we often talk about what they're learning, what they're doing in religion class. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, he, they were given an assignment to write an essay. And the essay was about uh, to choose any religion. And he chose Scientology. And I began to think, why can't our Catholic high schools in each of the four years take one of the gospels and learn about the about Jesus, learn who this man Jesus is in the world and in their life. And there, Dr. Groom talks about Jesus. So I'm on a high. I'm 85 years old, but I'm pondering writing a letter to the um, Catholic resource teachers asking this question. Am I, am I uh, out of line or what? But I'm, I'm thrilled with what you say. And I can't wait to get your book. Oh, good, Maureen. Wonderful. Thank you. What a wonderful comment. And I would say definitely go ahead and write, write to the principal. <laughs> That's school. And uh, I, I, think, I think young people need, uh, you know, Jesus says it in John chapter 14, verse 4 or 5. In my father's house, there are many mansions. In other words, there are many homes within God's family. And then he says, but I go to prepare a home for you in other words we have a home within god's family and i think we should we should root young people in their own home first and give them a sense of belonging a sense of security a sense of welcome inclusion hospitality and confidence in their own spiritual religious identity uh whatever that and as i said typically as catholic christians but then at a certain point, and I think it's midway through high school, uh, we also have to, it, I think it's wise to introduce them to the, to the great religious faiths of the world. And, and not to learn about them, but to learn from them. Yeah. Well, I okay. think there is a way of teaching the other traditions so that we're all enriched by it. That they, a, a, a devout young Catholic would be enriched, for example, by being exposed to 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 uh, Islam, to Judaism, whatever. But is right. we we can be enriched by it. But I think we have to have a confidence in our own home, and then we can sally forth and right. benefit from the wisdom and the spiritual wisdom of others. Because we're not the only people oh, to, whom God, to whom God has revealed God's self. <laughs> yes. 
interesting. Well, I appreciate that. Yes, I understand that too. And, and enriched certainly by Judaism as well. Um, just that they, I don't think that they really are finding out anything about who Jesus was in this world. I'll but tell I, them to buy my book, Maureen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <that's your> book. <laughs> Thanks so much, Maureen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a question here from Claude. Um, can we, could you speak on the influence of secularism and woke ideology on the delivery of curriculum? And um, I do think um, you, you have, you talk about Charles Taylor and secularism in your book. So uh, do you want to speak a little bit to that, Dr. Just give me the beginning of the question again, oh, Patricia. Okay. I wasn't quite following. Yeah. Um, could you ask our speaker to comment on the influence of secularism and woke ideology on the delivery of the curriculum? Yeah, and I think I think the secular ideology, the woke ideology, or whatever. I mean, we we have to take the reality of the world in which we find ourselves, and we have to enter into conversation, into dialogue with it in ways that can uh, that we that we 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 know more deeply all the more who we are. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if we're getting into a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And a little bit of everything else. I think that's one of the tendencies of our time. That at least some of the research uh, in the US of A that I read recently, um, th th there's a new category now uh, that they're talking about, like that the nuns, N O N E S, not N U N S, the N O N E S, that the nuns have increased exponentially, at least in the US of A, that it used to be 4% in 1970, now it's 30%, and um, falling off, that people who say there's no, no religion at all. But now they're saying there's a category and a growing category within that, that the nuns are very often, or typically, we presume that they're either atheist or agnostic. But now there's a growing group that the sociologists are calling nothing in particular, which is a, a pretty loose category. But it's people who say, who, who are faith, who, are, who have a belief in God. 65% of them pray, pray regularly. And yet... They're not particular, nothing in particular. Uh, uh, Grace Davy, the British uh, sociologist of religion, uh, and a very fine one she is, uh, talks, to, uh, refers to them as a little more elegantly, as uh, believers without belonging. Mm. And we have a growing number of believers who don't belong. But I think there is a way to invite them to belong yeah. and, and to, to, to welcome them in belonging. And of course, the great model of welcoming all, to me, is always that story of the, of the forgiving father and mother, uh, or of the prodigal son, if you prefer the old title. But uh, that those parents went out and welcomed them home, because I always think it was the mother who kept telling the old father, go out and have a look through the horizon. See, see if that kid child is coming home. <laughs> That's what my <laughs> mother used to do to my dad. So go out <laughs> into the horizon and see if there's any sign of them coming home for lunch or dinner on Sunday. Um, but I think I think the unconditional welcome that, that they gave to that prodigal, because the prodigal, they go out and then they welcome him before he makes his apology. Uh, he's coming home with an apology. I'm not worthy to be called your son, treat me like one of your hired servants. But they, they embrace him before he apologizes. So yeah. that kind of welcome, that unconditional welcome, I think that's what our church has to learn yeah. to do with yeah. and for people. And uh, I welcome all. Yeah. Uh, to the to the to the context i yeah. think both that you spoke of the domestic church you you know you you speak of that as being uh, also another place and space for people to learn their tradition and understand and come to understand jesus the historical figure yeah. and christ the anointed one uh, th that's a great point bori uh, patricia it's a great point because you see as catholics we often fell into the kind of a rut of send them to Catholic school. They'll take care of it. Uh, you know, we, we're not, you know, we'll pay tuition or whatever. We'll, we'll take them there and back. But uh, we, with the school, we'll make Catholics out of them. Can't be done. Mm -hmm. The school can be supported, but it really is primarily in the home. So in a sense, as parents, we are responsible, primarily responsible. It's interesting that at baptism, uh, when they give, when they give, hand the lighted candle, to the parents to say this this is the light of christ is, is you're to be kept burning brightly you will be the first educators of your children in the ways of faith so it begins with baptism 
So the, the school, of course, can be a huge help, but it doesn't uh, excuse us as parents. Of no, our responsibility. And, and I, think, I think that is the beauty of your book, because we can read the book as leaders in Catholic education, as uh, educators, as people participating in something that we can other, we can say is, is something else. But what you do in your book, you also give us some key theologians as educators and help us to understand how those key theologians might be able to inform our practice in our classroom, but also beyond. Um, I point out on page 83, uh, you speak of Julian of Norwich, um, you know, who would surely urge Catholic educators to be representative of God's love to their students, to reflect to them, and especially to those who need loving assurance most, that they are unconditionally loved by God, who is full of mercy for them. I think that's a beautiful way to enter into um, understanding uh, our historical theological background. Yes, wonderful, wonderful, Patricia. And you know, it reflects uh, Julian and, those, and the other, uh, Mary, uh, Mary Ward and Angela Ricci, the other great women leaders that I try to raise up out of the tradition. Mm -hmm. they, they represent extraordinary wisdom for us in our day. Uh, like Julian, uh, constantly addressing God as mother, as loving mother, uh, and addressing Jesus, the, the risen Christ, as, as, as a, like a brother and a sister, that in a sense, the risen Christ is above gender identity. Um, but constantly referring to God in feminine terms. Now here she is writing in the 14th century. She could have been burnt at the stake for it. Um, the courage that she had, but what an inspiration to us today to be sensitive in our language and our God talk and not to simply constantly assume that God is Father, 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 Father. I have no problem calling God Father, why not call God Mother and, and uh, Parent and Loving gra and Granny? <laughs> uh, one of the uh, many old traditions of the Native American peoples is to refer to God as a grandmother. But all of our language for God is inadequate mm -hmm. and falls short. None of it is, is, is sufficient to capture the ultimate mystery of God. But, but anyway, it's just amazing the, the wisdom we can find in the past 2000 years that in many ways we've often forgotten and left behind. And I tried to write the book in a way that would be readable for any uh, person of goodwill and average education, that it's not a, 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 a complicated doctrinal or theological tome. I've written a little of those too, but, but <laughs> after I got tenure, I stopped writing. I stopped talking that way. And I went back to my usual style. We but, don't want uh, you to stop writing. We don't want you to stop writing. <laughs> yeah. um, so we are, we are coming close to the end. And I think um, uh, this book is, is uh, and can be used in so many ways, but in writing the book, can you tell us, how do you see this being used in schools, in parishes, and in other places where Catholic education happens? Yeah, and, and the funny thing is a lot of people are, buy, are buying it and, and they're not involved in education at all. They just find it a wonderful, lovely, inspiring summary of what it means to be a Catholic Christian. And mm -hmm. what it, that means for how you run a school is important, but that's not their primary interest. Their interest is in nurturing their own faith. So that's been a kind of a surprise for me. Uh, that ordinary everyday people that weren't involved uh, professionally in Catholic education were, were purchasing it and in benefiting from it. And I've had lots of notes and emails and what have you. Um, but certainly Catholic educators, I think, and regardless of what their own uh, status in faith or journey might be, uh, I think they can appreciate and embrace the horizon. That's, that's outlined there. One of my favorite Catholic educators is uh, here in Boston is a, a Lutheran woman who is a devout practicing Lutheran, but she deliberately teaches in a Catholic school because she can take her faith and put it to work throughout the curriculum. And um, so I think it has a possibility uh, even beyond you know, Catholic school educators. Uh, to nurture the Catholic identity. So, because when you talk about the Catholic identity of our schools, mm -hmm. the prior conversation is what, is what is Catholic identity? So I try to lay that out first and then say what it would mean for the life of a school. So hopefully it can, it can have that appeal. And I would love this book to, to, to circulate well 
Uh, and uh, you know, I, I used to say that, that when I was advertising my books that our son uh, needed new shoes for the winter. So <laughs> in a sense, Teddy has the new shoes now and uh, I can't pretend that otherwise, but I just love it to go far and wide mm. because of what it says. Mm. And, uh, and I started writing it probably about 40 years ago. And, wow. and then uh, I kept thinking about it all over the years and talking about it on and off. But, but uh, with the pandemic, you know, I had time at home and extra time and we we're teaching on, online and on Zoom. And it uh, wasn't as much of a, uh, I had more time in my hands. So I got the opportunity to write it. So, and then I was delighted that Orbis, who was a fine publisher, published it. And that is distributed in Canada by Novalis. So that was a great partnership as well. Yeah. So it's a great blessing to me to get it out there and to have the fun conversations about it, like what we're having this morning. Absolutely. So we have two more questions. In your opinion, what is the balance between teaching in an ethos grounded in our faith and actually having aspects of our faith embedded in the curriculum con or content, especially in subjects that might be considered more difficult to do, such as math and science and computer science? Ah, uh, Great question. This is one of the gifts of Catholic education. We say both and. We don't say reason alone. We say faith and reason. Mm -hmm. We say revelation and science. We say knowledge and values, information and formation. All of those ands in many ways have been excluded by our public, our government, by our public school education. That you can't, you just talk science. You don't talk about revelation. Uh, you just have talk about reason. You don't talk about faith. But one of the great gifts of, ed, of Catholic schools is we can do both and. And for, so for example, let me give a concrete example. Can you go into your, this is high school teaching. Can you go into your science class and teach young people about cosmogenesis? That the world was made with a big bang 14 billion years ago and blah, blah, blah. Can you do that in your science class and then go into your religion or theology class and teach them the, the, the Genesis chapter one, that God made the world in six days and on the seventh day God rested? Mm -hmm. and, and the answer is yes, of course you can. Because there are two different ways of knowing. One is a scientific, one is more metaphorical, allegorical, or parabolic, uh, but it contains fantastic wisdom. And, and wisdom that we couldn't know from the purely scientific. So that old story in Genesis teaches us that God made all people, male and female. It says it explicitly. And in the divine image and likeness. So that there's nobody more in God's image and likeness uh, than, than anybody else. And then it says that God, God made us stewards uh, of creation to take care of it. And then at the end, it says, and God looked upon what God had saw and saw that it was very good. That's the only time the superlative is used at the end of the sixth day. On the other five days, God looks at what God has made and sees that it's good. But at the end of the sixth day, God looked at what God had made and it was very good. And, it was alive. and then if you go on into chapter two of Genesis, we're alive by the very breath of God. It's, it's the divine life that God breathed, God's own breath of life into Hadam, into Adam, into the earth person. Earth person that we've often mistranslated as man. Uh, and Adam became alive, nefesh, with the life of God. Um, it's, it's just, so you can't learn that in science class. Uh, nor can you learn about 14 billion years in religion class. But you can do both. And, it, it, and as I said, that the religious, the spiritual, the, the revelation adds tremendous breadth and depth and hope to the purely scientific. And you can take a thousand other examples of how to put yeah. faith and, and reason together okay. uh, and have them make eminent good sense. Yes, that is the next question. Do you have any pragmatic suggestions in which bringing Jesus to the students in areas other than just religion class can be done, especially if most of the staff aren't affiliated with Christianity or aren't knowledgeable in the faith? So same sort of idea, just specifically around Jesus. How do we, how do we bring yeah, Jesus Patricia, I'm going to turn the tide on you because you've written very fine religion curricula. <laughs> uh, how did you manage to do that? Well, I, when you know what I think you said it, um, I think that when you see God in all spaces and places, when you have a creative imagination uh, around where God is and who God is, um, it, it's actually pretty, pretty quick 
And yeah. I think you mentioned that. I think you mentioned that. <laughs> but, you know, in, 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 in the cosmos, in, in, in just the, the relationships. In the sciences, yeah. But, but, you know, I've had math teachers come up to me. You know, I don't think we should be dragging in God talk you know, in every subject. Uh, it is more obviously has its place in the theology or religion curriculum of the school. Mm -hmm. But but I mean, as I said, old Joe Horn deepened our sacramental imagination in science class. And I have, a, I have a friend who's a math teacher and he always reminds his students that you can't do math without positing infinity. Mm -hmm. You can't do math without infinity. And, and, and then the ethic that runs through math. I mean, you can't cheat on the figures. You have to honor you have to honor the figures and what they amount to. So he had a whole list of things that he does by way of forming young people in ethic and an outlook on life and what have you as a math teacher. So, uh, I mean, I'm not, that's beyond my competence, God knows. But, but I think there are ways without dragging in the God talk that all of the people in our school can, can give that sense of a transcendent horizon, mm -hmm. that life has purpose, life has meaning, uh, life is worthwhile. Life is a gift, it's to be embraced and lived uh, with joy. And uh, I think any of the faculty or any of the staff of a Catholic school can embrace that outlook and, and then mediate uh, to students. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, there is another question. Um, you speak of Catholic identity with the possibility of viewing Catholic churches across the country during this pandemic. I quickly noticed that our liturgical language has become more evangelical. This is happening in our Catholic schools as well, especially in the use of evangelical music for mass and prayer. Uh, how can you speak about appropriate Catholic liturgical language in, in our schools? Well, I, I think the liturgical language has to reflect uh, the core convictions of our faith. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm always apprehensive when they, when they do Amazing Grace. Uh, amazing Grace, now sometimes I like it when they serve, uh, who saved a wretch like me. Uh, that's not our theology of the person. Mm -hmm. Now, they, in some parishes now they're saying, who say, who, who, who say uh, to, uh, how, how great thou art, who saved and set me free rather than a wretch like me. So I think we'd be careful of the songs we sing. Uh, it's one of the most powerful ways we teach. Uh, so we have to sing good Catholic theology and some evangelical uh, uh, songs and hymns are indeed reflect good theology, but some do not. And in fact, I was in, uh, I lived in a parish a few years ago and I was quite active in the parish and we hired a young musician for our youth, for our youth mass on a Sunday evening. And after about two months, I went to the pastor and I said, Father, we have to get rid of him. He says, God, he gets them all singing. He gets them all singing. But he was singing a poor theology by way of Catholic faith. It was all about God saving me and washing me in the blood of the lamb and I am saved and I am free from sin. But, but there was nothing about the no, we are Christians by our love, by our love. The no, we are Christians by our love. So it was all about God saving us. And we had no one, nothing else to do or accept our salvation. No, we got to go out and, and live it. So there was nothing about living the faith in the music he was singing for our young people. And we did, we, we did. He was from a, a, a very strict evangelical tradition. And uh, so we're to sing good theology uh, is the point. Yeah, because it all educates yeah. in a very subtle way. People don't sit there, you know, thinking about it very much, but, but it, it, if we sing poor theology uh, and some of the ultra evangelical uh, tunes or hymns, I think would not be appropriate to Catholic tradition. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the, I guess, I, I think we are close to the end. We are at uh, 1055 already. Um, would you please give us your last thoughts and uh, hopefully um, ignite in us again uh, a want and desire to read this book? I, I loved it and I'm so, so very thankful, but please. Uh, Dr. Groom, please give us your final thoughts. Oh, well, thank you. Well, thank you again to Joe and for lining up this and, and to, to uh, Novalis and to you, Patricia, for your wonderful comments and questions and for reading the book so carefully. I mean, I am, I'm delighted and flattered. Um, I, I don't know that I have any great parting wisdom. I, I think uh, 
I'd love to think of the book becoming a, a source of conversation. And I deliberately structure each chapter uh, to encourage that. And not just at the end of the chapter, but I usually introduce a theme like who is the person and who did Jesus see as the person, who does Catholic theology understand as human per personhood, et cetera. So we, I start with posing the question and said, this is a crucial question for all of us, especially for educators. But then I pause and I ask two or three questions. I watch, what's your sense of the person? And how does that shape how you teach or how you parent or whatever it is? Then I go on and I make proposals out of the tradition, out of the, out of the gospels of Jesus and the Christ and then the Catholic tradition in general. And then I come back into more questions and, and, and uh, but but all of the questions at the end are toward uh, people's, not just their insights, but what they're going to do with them, their judgments, their decisions, as Lonergan might say. What are you going to do with this? How can you put it to work, etc.? So the book is written very much as a participatory pedagogy. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to think that people could get two or three or four or five friends together regularly on a, on a maybe on a Friday evening and maybe have a glass of wine, <laughs> old Catholic tradition. And uh, thank God, we've never, we never condemned, we never condemned alcohol. Of course, we can abuse it or misuse it, but we've always looked at it as a gift of God. So uh, have a chat and, and share your wisdom, because we all have that wisdom, and much of it hard won from the, from, the, from the journey of life. So I'd love to think of people gathering together for a good conversation around each chapter, and that would give them at least 10 or 12 meetings. Awesome. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. And we will be doing that. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Thank well, C.S. Lewis wrote, we meet no ordinary people in our lives. And you certainly, Mr. Groom, are no ordinary person. You're a profound catechetical voice and a prophetic voice for Catholic education. After having read so much of your work over the years, I'll tell you that this moment for me, it has been epic. And so I thank you uh, personally, and I thank you professionally, and I thank you also on behalf of uh, Bayer Canada and Novalis, as well as uh, the Catholic Curriculum Co Corporation. Um, so much of what you have written over the years comes to fruition in this new book. And I feel like I could ask you probably at least another hour's worth of questions. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I think it, it is foundational for all institutions who provide any type of Catholic education. Thank you for your presence and also for your presence in the vocation um, of so many educators like myself across the country who learn from your scholarship and, um, and learn an understanding of our faith tradition. Thank you for your continued ministry, Mr. Groom. Um, for your support you, of Catholic Patricia. educators. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. That's powerful and beautiful. And I'm deeply indebted to you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to Joe. Well, thank you. Thank you both, Patricia and Tom, for your time with us this morning. Thank you, Tom, especially for walking us through our tradition uh, and reminding us of the prime source of not just our faith in Jesus Christ, but also of a model for those of us who are in Catholic education. As, uh, as we carry on uh, through very strange times in many ways and, and try to discern how we can continue to, to do the best we can to uh, engage our world in this great mission of Catholic education. I wanna thank you, thank you Patricia for so skillfully guiding us through the conversation and bringing in uh, the comments and suggestions and questions from our, our participants this morning. Um, thank all of you. I'm really happy that we were able to have this discussion. We got to most of the questions, but not all, but uh, we certainly had a really uh, wide ranging discussion. Finally, I, I do want to share with you um, one slide um, to tell you how you can get your own copy of the book uh, with a 20% discount. If you were to go to www.novalis.ca, that's our website. The book is called What Makes Education Catholic? And if you use the code WMEC20, you will get a 20% uh, off the retail price when you're checking out. So write that down, take advantage of it. I'll remind you as well, that we're, this uh, session today has been recorded. And in a few days, we will let everyone know how to uh, get access to that recording. So once again, Thank you all for being with us this morning. Uh, we, we appreciate uh, your participation and we appreciate the chance to, 
to talk so uh, so closely and so deeply about something that uh, is at the so close to the hearts of all of us. Take care, one and all. We'll see you at our next webinar.